Good evening. My name is Leslie Sweetum, and I'm a house manager at Town Hall. On behalf of the staff at Town Hall Seattle, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's presentation, featuring cutting edge research by UW students Violet Sorrentino and Tessa Code. This is the final event in the UW Engage Science series, and we are so pleased to be able to once again offer this platform for these students and their important and engaging work. As we get underway, I would like to acknowledge our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continuing use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. We are so glad to have you join us tonight. Town Hall is adding new events and podcasts every day. Visit our website to view our calendar of upcoming events and sign up for our e-newsletter to receive updates as future events are added this season. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. As part of our Arno G. Moltolsky Science Lecture Series, this event is supported by Microsoft. And now, join me in welcoming UW graduate student and instructor of the Engage Science Communication course this year, Nicole Gr Gregorio, to introduce the program and our first speaker. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming tonight. I'm, I was very honored to instruct our Engage Science Communication course last winter. Um, this course is run by a group of graduate students at the University of Washington um, called Engage. And the group really seeks to prepare a group of excellent UW graduate students with the skills they need to communicate about their work with the general public. So uh, Engage hopes to improve science communication education at the University of Washington and really envisions a future where scientists more effectively and freely communicate with the public about their work. So tonight we have two of our incredible students from the course who are here to tell you about their graduate work. Um, their talks represent real research happening at the University of Washington right now, so we hope you enjoy this unique opportunity to get a behind-the-scenes look at it. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Vi Violet Sorrentino, who is a cell biology graduate student at the Fred Hutch Cancer Center, where she uses microscopic worms to study communication between two types of brain cells. The conversation between these cells ha helps to maintain a help happy and healthy brain, and she is working to define the molecular language that these cells speak. So please join me in welcoming Violet. Um. Hi, everyone. Um, so as Nicole um, already said, my name is Violet. Um, and today, I hope you, this statement, your brain is like a city, may not be evident to you at this point, but I hope by the end of the talk you'll understand why I've said this. Um, and I just want to give a little bit of a brief background. So I am from New York, so I have always loved cities, and I feel most comfortable in cities. This is, in fact, the smallest city I've ever lived in. <laughs> um, and, you know, as a kid, I was always really fascinated by how we go from, like, a forest to a landscaped city, you know, full of skyscrapers and buildings and houses. How does that um, process happen, you know, over a hundred years? In the same way, when I started doing biology, I became really interested in how we go from a single-celled organism to a multicellular, complex animal like a human being. So what are the processes that happen? And so this sort of fundamental question has guided me as I have um, done research for almost a decade at this point, so which is kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, you may not see any similarity between the two photos. On the left, you have a cartoon of the human brain, and on the right, we have a picture of lovely Seattle, where we all live. Um, and I just want to say, so you're, you're um, a city like Seattle is made up of not only buildings, so this includes like skyscrapers, like um, structures like 
uh, the Space Needle and houses as well, but it also has lots of machinery that's responsible for taking care of those structures. So here we have a picture of an excavator, um, you know, which clears debris from construction sites, um, and a garbage truck, which is really important for, you know, keeping our city looking beautiful um, through every season. And then in the same way, your brain has cells. Um, so neurons are the cells of the brain that communicate with one another um, and help us, you know, uh, do uh, have responses to um, external stimuli and do behavior. So for example, the neurons in your brain are allowing you to sit here and listen to me talk right now. Um, we also have glia, which are commonly known as support cells in the brain. And these are like those... Um, dump trucks and excavators and garbage trucks, making sure that our brain is operating as effectively as possible throughout our lives. Um, and big cities like Seattle, which has a population of about a million people, are really complex systems. You know, there's a lot going on to make sure that like your bus comes on time, that you're not tripping over garbage when you walk on the, on the street. Um, and so let's say a city like Seattle has like 700 excavators. These are purely made up numbers. If you know the actual numbers, please let me know. Um, let's say we have 100 cranes. I was informed when I first gave this talk that at one point Seattle had the most cranes of any American city, which is kind of crazy. Um, and, you know, 500 garbage trucks. And all of these, uh, uh, all of this infrastructure is making sure that uh, the city is, is running smoothly. So glial cells, like a garbage truck that clears away trash or an excavator that's picking up debris and you know, loose rocks at a construction site, glia are actually capable of clearing away cell debris that belongs to neurons. So here is a glia in pink and a neuron in green, and they're interacting with each other. And at the interface of that interaction, you would actually be able to see that the glia is eating portions of the neuron. Um, and this happens throughout life. It's particularly important early on when our brain is just beginning to you know, assume its final form. Um, and it continues throughout life as we learn. And it's really important for processes like learning and memory. And we know that sometimes things can go wrong with this process during aging, and it leads to disease. And this process is known as glial pruning. Um, like the pruning of a bush, you know, you've got this glial cell kind of eating controlled portions of the neuron. And of course, that city machinery that I talked about wouldn't be able to operate without the workers who are actually you know, driving it. So for those 500 or 700 garbage trucks in the city of Seattle, we have 500 you know, garbage men or people that are operating. And similarly, you know, we have like a thousand construction workers that are making sure that those dozens of construction sites you see downtown are actually, you know, getting somewhere. <laughs> um, so proteins are actually the biological workers of the brain, like those uh, garbage truck, uh, garbage men and those construction workers. And without proteins, our cells wouldn't be able to do anything. So as much as Elon Musk would like us to live in a world where we have self-driving cars, that's not really the reality right now. So we need drivers that are actually sitting um, and operating the machinery. So here, and protein comes from DNA. So just to give you a very brief background of that, here we have some DNA. I think I have, oh yeah. Um, here we have some DNA. And when the DNA has no mutations or mistakes in it, this is known as wild type. Um, and this DNA codes for a protein. It gets read by the machinery of the cell and ultimately a protein gets made. And the protein is the thing that's actually carrying out all these cell, uh, cellular activities. So it's like our construction worker, Mr. Bob the Builder. <laughs> um, now, if we were to introduce a mutation into this DNA, so there's a mistake um, and the DNA is no longer written exactly as it should be, um, we have several things that could happen. So first of all, no protein could get made at all. Um, so we are missing our Bob the Builder. And as much as we would like construction to happen, it's just not going to happen without him. We could get you know, a subtle change to the ultimate structure of the protein, so one small change. It's as if 
suddenly Bob the Builder were, rather than two arms, you were to have an arm and a wing. So he could get some work done, but probably not, you know, the full capacity he was at if he were a wild type Bob. And finally, we could get a totally different protein. So let's say you were expecting a crew of 100 construction workers to show up, and instead you get 100 Swedish chefs. So obviously this is not fantastic um, for the cell, and so uh, mutations can give a, can um, give, a, uh, give rise to all of these possibilities. So one important thing, I've talked about this process of glial pruning, where the glia is eating parts of the neurons. So we actually know the machinery of glial pruning. We know which glial cells are doing this. We don't know who is operating this machinery. We don't know who the drivers or the proteins are. And so that's a big question that in my field we want to answer. Um, so solving problems in big cities like Seattle is quite challenging. So let's say, for example, you were to have garbage piling up in the streets, you were to have buildings that were falling into disrepair, and suddenly important structures were just suddenly were just going um, disappearing overnight. So here we have the beautiful Space Needle has suddenly disappeared. <laughs> um, so asking, you know, which drivers, which garbage men, which uh, construction workers are suddenly missing and not doing their jobs is really hard when you have a city of a million people. Like, how do you pinpoint just one guy or a group of guys <laughs> um, as being the source of the issue? Um, and then how do you implement a so solution that actually works for this whole complex um, structure of the city? Um, and in the same vein, solving problems in big brains, so human brains, is really challenging as well. So um, those metaphors do not just come from my brain. <laughs> uh, they have real life equivalents. So for example, in Alzheimer's disease, you get, um, these are complex words on the side, but you get these neurofibrillary tangles and amyloid plaques, which are essentially just junk protein that builds up and causes your cells and your neurons not to work properly. Similarly, in a disease like multiple sclerosis, MS, or Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, we get um, you know, the breakdown of important cellular structures and neurons, which means they no longer work as before. And finally, in a disease like Parkinson's, we actually get the disappearance or death of really large populations of cells, um, and it's cells, particularly neurons in a specific part of the brain. So as I'm sure some of you are aware, not, none of these diseases have cures. Um, so really, ultimately, the work that I hope to do is to answer questions that can tackle these diseases. Um, so one of the solutions in the field of neuroscience is actually looking at similar problems on smaller scales. So here, um, maybe some of you have been to Leavenworth. It's a very cute sort of Bavarian-themed town in the Cascades. Um, but it happens to be a lot smaller than Seattle. So it's only about 2,000 people that live there. Um, and it has all the same machinery operating in the city, but on a much smaller scale. So rather than 700 excavators, now we have three. Rather than you know a fleet of 1,000 garbage trucks, now we have two. Um, and similarly, um, we have a lot fewer players. So, you know, rather than 500 garbage men, now we have three, and rather than 1,000 construction men, now we have five. And so we can study very similar product problems, um, but it's a lot easier to pinpoint the source of those problems and to figure out um, how to implement a working solution. So in the same way, I uh, don't study human neurons. Humans have, unfortunately, 100 billion neurons and 100 billion glia, so asking questions about how the process of pruning happens um, with any like non-confusing resolution is really hard. Um, so I use C. elegans, and I'll call them worms throughout the rest of the talk, but they do have a scientific name, C. elegans. elegans. Um, and they only have 302 neurons and 56 glia, so it's a lot easier to study them. They have a 100% known nervous system, which is simply not the case for humans. Um, their brains are the same from worm to worm, and I'm sure it's pretty obvious that no two humans' brains are the same. Um, 
they're visually transparent, so you can put them under the microscope and see all of their cells inside their bodies. And we can manipulate their DNA, which is unfortunately unethical when it comes to people. Um, so we can figure out what certain genes or proteins are doing um, in the process of pruning. And they also have a pretty short lifespan. So from egg to uh, fertile adult only takes three days. Uh, <laughs> that's, again, not true for people, you know. <laughs> so worms are just poised to be a much more, um, a much easier model to work with when we're studying um, questions about the brain. And of course, they're a lot smaller as well. So the average human man is, you know, five foot nine inches. The average worm is about a millimeter long, which is kind of hard to conceptualize. So it's basically the diameter of, you know, a pencil lead. <laughs> so they're really quite small. Um, they're truly microscopic. And in the worm, so on the left, we have a picture of a worm, um, which you would see when you're just looking under the microscope. And I study one neuron and one glia that um, talk to each other in this worm. So if we were to zoom in on just the head of the worm, um, we would see these two cells. Um, and they extend. So for the cell body is that, I don't know if I have a. Whatever, that's fine. <laughs> so um, these two circular structures are known as the cell bodies. They extend what's called a process up to the very, very nose tip of the animal, and that's where they have what we call the ending. Um, ooh. Okay. Um, and if we were to zoom in on that ending, you'd see this kind of finger-like structure of the neuron. Um, and it's fully enveloped by this glia cell. So the important thing about this process is that it mirrors what we see in humans. So this glial cell eats parts of the neuron throughout its life. So here we can see the cell body, the process, and the ending. And what we observe is that there are pieces of this neuron that sort of get pinched off, get taken up by the glia, make their way down the process and ultimately make it to the cell body where they're processed um, and degraded. So if any of you are familiar with hungry, hungry hippos, you have a little bit of insight into what I actually do in the lab on a daily basis. So premise of the game is that you have these plastic hippos and you're trying to eat up as many balls as possible and whoever eats the most balls at the end wins. Um, so I can actually look at the cell body, which I've boxed here, and count the number of neuron pieces that have been eaten by the glia. And this gives me a readout of how much pruning is happening in this cell. Um, so here we have a wild type animal. So that means that the DNA is fully unaltered. There's no changes in it. Um, and that has an average of, let's say, eight neuron pieces. We can also look at mutants that cause, so these are where the DNA has been altered and that protein is different than what it should be. Um, so some mutants will have less engulfment and some mutants will have more engulfment um, or pruning. Uh, and that is, um, we can then assess why that's the case and how these uh, proteins that are encoded by these genes um, contributes to that that we are observing. So one big question that I have, and that hasn't really been answered by other scientists in this field, is what happens to neuron garbage? So we can think of these pieces as essentially garbage. They're debris that needs to be cleared away. Um, but we don't know how that clearing away is happening. So who our garbage man, in, our garbage men or man is, is totally a mystery. Um, but I might have actually identified one of the garbage men that's involved in clearing away these neuron um, debris or this neuron garbage. So I looked at those wild type animals and these are real numbers. What you saw before was just, you know, uh, just a mock-up. But I looked at these wild type animals and I saw 
their average of about eight pieces of neuron per glial cell. And then I looked at this mutant called TAP5. Um, and I looked at a whole bunch of mutants, but this one seemed pretty cool to me, and that's why I wanted to look at it. And what makes me think that it's one of the glial garbage men is that I did an important experiment that we refer to as a rescue. So what I did is I took this protein and I put it in the cell that I thought it was acting in. So this animal doesn't have this protein because of this mutation in the gene. So I took the protein and put it back where I thought it would act. And I wanted to know if that would be able to restore the number of neuron pieces back to what I was originally seeing in the wild type background. And in fact, it really clearly did, which is, you know, you don't always get results like this in science. So this was very exciting to me. Um, so this told me that I think TAP5 is acting in the glia to help um, clear away those neuron pieces. So the next big question that I have, and I'm actively working on this right now, is figuring out where in the glia TAP5 is actually acting. So that big pink cell that I showed you, obviously it has a lot of parts. It has the ending, the process, as well as the cell body. So where is this protein sitting in there to actually carry out its function? So if we were to think about how garbage <laughs> in a city or a town um, gets moved from a house where the garbage has been, you know, is sitting on the curb waiting to be picked up to the dump. So we have, you know, someone at the house actually taking the trash out of the cans and putting it in the car. Uh, and we can think of that as acting right up at that ending. So the glial cell is interacting with those pieces of neuron and helping to put them in the glia. Alternatively, there needs to be someone in the garbage truck to actually drive it to the dump. <laughs> And so we could think of um, if TAP5 were acting along the process to help carry the garbage to the cell body. And then finally, you need someone actually waiting at the dump to dispose of the trash properly, whether it be burning or, you know, et cetera. Um, and so we can think of TAP5 potentially acting in the cell body of the glia to help um, dispose of that trash. So one of the things I'm doing, and in fact, I will be doing this this week, actually, is um, building tools to figure out where TAP5 is located. So our garbage guy, he probably has a phone. <laughs> if he didn't, I would be surprised. Uh, his phone probably has something like find my iPhone on it, which you can use to you know, see where your phone is. Let's say his partner wanted to check up on him, see where he was, um, he would probably, the uh, they would probably take a look at their phone and, and check Find My iPhone and see their location. In a similar way, I can put what's known as a fluorescent protein onto my um, protein of interest, and we call this a tag. Um, and this protein actually comes from jellyfish, and when you shine a certain um, spectra of light at it, it will fluoresce under a microscope and glow bright green. So I'm making this specially tagged TAT5 protein, and then I can look at where it's located in the glia under a microscope. So if I see green, you know, right up at the ending, it's very likely that TAT5 could be helping to put that trash in the glial cell. Um, ooh, sorry, I went backwards. There you go. Okay. <laughs> if I see green along the process, that could correspond to actually trafficking that neuron garbage down to the cell body. And finally, if I see green in the cell body, then maybe TAP5 is acting there to help degrade those pieces and break them down. Um, so I've talked a lot about figuring out where TAP5 is acting in the glia, but we can also look at the consequences of not having TAP5 on the neuron. Um, so what happens to the neuron without TAP5? So one thing I've done is I've looked at the shape of the neuron to see if it changes. Neuron shapes are exceptionally important. They basically dictate what kind of um, sensory input that, sh that cell is able to sense. So this neuron senses temperature, and it has this fan-like structure that looks something like this that allows it to have quite a bit of surface area to really accurately um, detect temperature. So the worms are exceptional thermometers. They can, um, I think the changes in temperature that they can detect are like 
half of a, uh, no, 0 0.05 degrees Celsius. So they are exceptionally sensitive. And this structure is very important for that. So I decided to look in those TAT5 mutants and see if I saw any weird stuff going on with the cell. And in fact, I did. I saw quite a few of these pieces The video is being weird, but it's just a 3D, and you can see these kind of brightly colored pieces that seem to be detached from the neuron ending, and I see a lot more of those in these mutants, which makes me think that um, TAT5 is actually helping to put those pieces in the garbage truck, so acting somewhere at the ending to do this. And so that's why looking at its location in the cell is really important. And I can also ask... Ooh. I can also, ooh, there we go. <laughs> I can ask if the function of this neuron also changes. So I mentioned that this neuron is very good at detecting changes in temperature. Um, and it helps to mediate uh, temperature sensing behaviors in the worm. So um, I can ask if in these mutants, I suddenly see um, defects in this temperature sensing behavior. And so I can know if, um, affecting this very uh, complex process of pruning actually has um, impacts on the um, ability of the animal to you know, survive in its environment. So I've talked to you about how we can use worms like Leavenworth as kind of a case study to look at human biology. I've talked about this glia and neuron pair in the worm and how this correlates to glias, glia and neurons that we have in humans. And bridging the gap between these two systems is TAT5. So um, one thing that you should note is I talked about uh, some of the brain diseases that you can see. Um, what I should also note is that if we were to look at the amount of pruning that was happening in humans, so this changes throughout life. Um, that black line is showing basically in what you'd see in a wild type person, essentially. Um, and so we have a lot of pruning right as the brain is beginning to develop. And then we have some spikes, you know, along life, but ultimately the amount of that declines. So in cases of neurodivergence, so people who, you know, are on the autism spectrum, we think that they actually have a lot less pruning throughout life. So understanding this process helps us understand how neurodivergent brains get built. On the other hand, we know that if you have way too much pruning late in life, that can lead to a diseases like Alzheimer's. So understanding how that amount of pruning is regulated, potentially through garbage men like TAT5, is really important. And humans have a protein that is very similar to TAT5. Um, people without this protein are known to have a lot of brain problems. We, we don't understand why that's the case. Um, and one big question is, can we target this gene with drugs to help prevent brain disease? So that's only this gene. I'm, I think, the first person ever to look at this gene. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and I think it has a lot of interesting implications for the field of neuroscience. Um, and ultimately, I just want to preserve the brain into old age. So I want to see Seattle, you know, still standing, the Space Needle, <laughs> um, in 100 years. And in the same way, I want humans to... Um, have their brain be working, you know, up to age 100. So that's my ultimate goal. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank my lab, particularly Akanksha Singhvi, who's my mentor, um, and Stefan, who's a former grad student in the lab, who helped me do a lot of this, or did a lot of the, laid a lot of the groundwork for my work, um, my sources of funding, as well as my wonderful um, Engage class of 2023, which has, like, provided so much um, really important feedback as I crafted this talk. Um, yeah. Um, thanks for listening. All right. Uh, thank you, Violet, for an excellent talk. Our second speaker is Tessa Code, who is a graduate student at the University of Washington. Um, she works as a technician for the US Geological Survey Western Fisheries Research Center. Um, and her research uses hydroacoustics and light sensors to study the effect of artificial light 
on fish predator prey dynamics in water bodies around Seattle. So please join me in welcoming Tessa. I don't know much about worms, so, so we're just going to transition to a new topic here. Okay. All right. Let's make this a little better here. Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. <coughs> oh, this is not in presenter mode. Does this screen go in presenter mode, or is it? It doesn't. Oh. It Cool. All right. How how does one advance the slides on this? Oh, it's just by the clicker. It's not by the. Ah, oh. oh, there we go. Cool. Imagine, it's 1985 in Seattle. The Columbia Tower was just finished and is the tallest building in our skyline. Starbucks just started selling its latte at the Pike Place Market location, and you just bought your first home for $90,000. <laughs> Life is good. You and your friends on the particularly sunny days like to hang out on Lake Washington. And at this time, Lake Washington isn't just known for its seafair celebration or the hydroplane races, but it's also known for its fishing. The Lake Washington sockeye salmon fishery is fondly described as the heart of Seattle. It was the most productive sockeye fishery in the lower 48 states and brought in millions of dollars for the state. Many longtime residents of Seattle, including my family pictured here on the slides, uh, remember spending many summer evenings catching sockeye and cooking them for dinner. Despite being such a healthy fishery in the 1970s to early 2000s, in 2006, the sockeye fishery collapsed, and it hasn't returned since. Over 350,000 sockeye have to return to Lake Washington for the fishery to be open. And despite taking sockeye off the menu and eliminating the fishery, this hasn't happened for over 15 years. We're still experiencing dwindling population numbers. Fishery and watershed managers, avid anglers alike, are all looking for ways to recover this population before it's too late. However, in order to understand the recovery of sockeye, we need to understand the history of Lake Washington, the drastic changes that put it on the map, both for scientists and fishermen. Humans have lived on the shores of Lake Washington for thousands of years. The people of the Duwamish tribe that lived near Lake Washington were referred to as the people of the large lake. And at this time, Lake Washington and Lake Union were physically separated by this narrow strip of land. The arrival of the Denny Party in 1851 marks the founding of Seattle as we know it. And as the city of Seattle grew, an emphasis was placed to create a more efficient passageway between Lake Washington and the Puget Sound. Shown here is the construction of the Montlake Cut in 1916, where they excavated that small, that narrow piece of land to start connecting those bodies of water. As they linked Lake Washington to Lake Union and ultimately the Sound, it enabled access to Lake Washington, but the construction of the canal lowered the level of Lake Washington, exposing by nine feet, exposing a lot of shoreline and also rerouting the hydrology of the lake. So previous to the construction of the canal, Lake Washington water flowed out through the southern tip of the lake. And after the Montlake Cut and the canal were created, the water began to flow out the, out the middle section. During this time, the Cedar River was rerouted to go into Lake Washington instead of the Duwamish. And at this time, Baker River sockeye were released into the Cedar River, which started our lake, famous Lake Washington sockeye in around 1930. Now, with the growing population around Lake Washington, the smell also increased. In the 1940s and 50s, Lake Washington was refer referred to as Lake Stinko because of its terrible smell and the fact that it looked like it just had this really thick pond scum all over it. So 
This was due to aging septic tanks as well as an aging sewer system. And researchers in Lake Washington or in the universe at the University of Washington took notice at the quality of the lake. And they urged the, um, the surrounding cities to to change uh, to try to change the quality of the lake water by diverting sewage and clearing up the lake. And this was a success. At this point, it was actually the the most costly lake uh, sewage cleanup in the country in its history. It was $140 million at the time. And it's now the best example of restoration by diversion of sewage, diversion of sewage in the world. In 1964, if you were looking down at the lake, you could probably, not that you'd want to stick your hand in it, but you could probably only see your hand if your arm was in the water. And by 1968, that transparency increased to 10 feet and beyond that to 15. Now, this transparency also was helped by the fact that there's this tiny little water flea, about one millimeter. And it's called a daphnia, and it helps to filter water and further increase the transparency beyond the removal of the pond scum. And in addition to helping the water seem like a better place to swim and recreate, this is also the primary food source for young sockeye salmon. So around 1967, the population of sockeye completely boomed, and the first fishery in the lake was opened. With the University of Washington being such a hub for fishery science, uh, it became Lake Washington became a field laboratory for students and researchers alike. The added knowledge, oh, we, um, the sockeye population there was studied immensely and new technologies were utilized and it's added a lot to what we know about sockeye in general today. As you'll see by this schematic that's pretty blurry um, of the Lake Washington food web, we basically know who eats who in the lake, who spawns there, and the historic population numbers, which in addition to the long uh, limnology history that we have, this limnology group is still taking data, the group that started taking data back when it was Lake Stinko, that still um, is happening today, as well as water quality uh, information taken from a King County water buoy. We, we know much more about Lake Washington than we know about most lakes in the world, which gives us a unique opportunity to look at new problems and questions coming from a really large body of research. So even though we don't know the exact reason why the sockeye population crash happened, because of the ongoing monitoring efforts and the historic research, we can identify areas of sockeye survivorship bottlenecks to try to recover the population effectively and efficiently. So sockeye are unique, are a unique species of salmon because they spend between 12 and 15 months in the lake before they go to the ocean. Other species spend between weeks or months before heading out to saltwater, but sockeye spend over a year. And that leaves them particularly vulnerable to potential stressors in the lake where they live. Now, in a typical lake that has sockeye, approximately 25% of those sockeye survive to be able to try to make it to the ocean. However, researchers found that in Lake Washington, only an average of 3% of sockeye were surviving the lake, which is a lot worse than 25. So as a juvenile sockeye, your biggest threat to survival is predation. Pretty much everything wants to eat you, especially the bigger fish in Lake Washington. And as you live in the offshore environment for about a year, your biggest predator that you have to worry about is a cutthroat trout. Cutthroat trout are native to Lake Washington, and since they've been around a while, we also know quite a bit about them. They've been studied a bunch, and what we've realized by laboratory experiments and looking at them, observing them in the field, is that they use their vision to hunt, and they're extremely good at hunting at really low light levels. So researchers put a cutthroat trout in its prey in a large fish tank, and they measured the distance that the cutthroat would be from a prey fish when it identified that the prey fish was there. And they looked at that over several different light levels and found that at these really dim light levels, like twilight, almost imperceptible changes between twilight and the brightness of, say, a half moon, cutthroat trout were exponentially better at seeing their prey than their prey were at seeing them. So they have the predatory advantage during this time. In 1985, 
scientists did an experiment where they went and they looked to see what cutthroat were eating and when throughout the lake. And they realized that cutthroat were only eating during these dawn and dusk periods, these periods of really low light, where they were better at seeing their prey when that their prey was at seeing them. So this jived with the laboratory experiments. Now in the early 2000s, when the sockeye population was getting a little bit more volatile and people didn't really know what was happening, they redid the, um, the field experiment and they found that cutthroat trout had full bellies. They were able to feed not just at these low light times, but throughout the entire night, which was a huge change from 1985. So scientists started to think about what could have changed at this period of time. And they realized that in this time, Seattle had increased in urbanization and elevated light levels around the lake were likely increasing nighttime brightness to enable salmon predators, the cutthroat trout, to be much more effective for much longer than they ever were. So instead of just having these fleeting periods where they're better at seeing their prey than their prey are at seeing them, now they have entire nights. And for sockeye, they have the entire night for an entire year or more to try to hunt their prey. And over time, this could reduce the survivorship of the sockeye population, and ultimately fewer will leave the lake, which is what we're seeing. So, you might think that city lights aren't that bright. You know, we're all pretty used to them. But if you compare them to a natural night sky, most cities are 100 times brighter than a sky just lit by stars. And this is only increasing in intensity as artificial light becomes more uh, accessible and cheaper to, to get. Uh, cities, not just in Seattle, but in the world, are increasing in, um, in light intensity each year. Uh, this is also accentuated in places with clouds, like this city where we live, where uh, sky glow increases the brightness released by artificial light by reflecting the light over longer distances than, when the, when, than where the lights actually are. So artificial light, when you think about artificial light and you think about fish, we have to think about how light penetrates through the water because it doesn't just stop at the surface. Now, certain types of light can penetrate deeper than others. In relatively clear lakes like we have in Lake Washington, um, green and blue light tend to penetrate the deepest. So if you'll see on the 520 bridge, it's completely enveloped in this beautiful blue light, which likely is penetrating down to where the fish are in the lake. Um, whereas you'll see that red light used as a navigational aid, does, aid doesn't penetrate as deeply. So if you think about Lake Washington, Seattle, Bellevue having such active populated shorelines, there are a lot of lights that shine directly onto the lake and we should probably start thinking about how those are affecting the light under the water as well. Because in recent years, Seattle and Lake Washington's surrounding cities have become more urbanized. Clusters of of skyscrapers have popped up, street lamps have been replaced with longer lasting LEDs, and the cities are just bigger than ever before. And this urbanization could be having unintended, unintended consequence, consequences on the survival of our salmon. I think these pictures are pretty great. The downtown of Bellevue in 1988 looks so small compared to 2023. It truly has grown quite a bit. And you see that throughout the shoreline of Lake Washington. So the Lake Washington sockeye population is quite unique. They migrate through our city. They spend the beginning and the ends of their lives just right beyond our toes in Lake Washington. And they live right next to this hustle and bustle of our urban landscape. So because of this proximity, it's not crazy to think that their survival is linked to the, to the urban landscape in which we live. Here we have sockeye moving through the Ballard Locks for the fish passage, which all salmon that spawn in both Lake Washington, the Cedar River, and um, Lake Sammamish have to pass through. And then they live amongst these highly, highly bright shorelines and spawn in rivers that we can go observe. It's, it's truly, truly incredible. So my work builds off past research, observations, and this body of work from Lake Washington, and it really is trying to directly answer the question, how does artificial light affect predation of juvenile sockeye salmon in Lake Washington? So to understand 
how artificial light affects fish, we have to figure out how bright it actually is out there. Um, this is a lot harder than you might think, um, and it involves staying awake all night, all the time. <laughs> so over the past year, I have boated basically over 100 miles throughout the lake, either on a motorized boat or on a kayak, measuring the relative light level on the, along the shoreline, but also in the middle of the lake. And this is a preliminary map with my findings. The um, yellow and orange are the brighter areas and the more purple color are the darker areas of the lake. So mapping this light is our first step to understanding what conditions the fish in Lake Washington experience as they're trying to grow and survive. So next, I'm comparing fish behavior in both bright and dark areas. I've got my bright sites highlighted with the red box and then the dark sites highlighted with the black box. And I'm looking, I'm using um, hydroacoustics, which if you've ever been fishing, it's like a really fancy fish finder. So it uses sound, which goes into the water, and based on the sound's echoes, I can figure out where the fish are, so the depth of the fish, I can figure out how big they are, and I can figure out some elements of their behavior. So are they schooling or are they solitary? Um, so I'm comparing behavior, the depth, and fish abundance in areas that are really bright in the lake and then areas that are really dark to see if there's a difference. So the bottom left photo is my view in the middle of the night when I'm doing these surveys. Uh, we have the echo sounder attached to the computer and the computer screen looks like this. So those little thumbnails, the kind of purpley specks, those are all fish. And the color of those specks tells us how big the fish are, how big their echo was when it was returned to our, our equipment. And we can also tell the depth that these fish are at. And all of this information is going in to help us answer the question, where are sockeye salmon most vulnerable to predation in our lake? And what areas should we focus on changing our light habits to mitigate this, um, this predation risk? So we're using light levels that we're measuring and then results from those lab experiments with the predators and the prey. And we are um, identifying areas to reduce and change our lighting in the lake. And we found that there's a pretty big bang for your buck. Um, looking at light, uh, looking at our laboratory measurements, we, we are, um, we think that with a 50% light reduction, there can be a 75% reduction of predation risk from current light level. So I'm going out to determine what is the current predation risk so we can change, we can map that change over time. Because the symptoms of urbanization could be having unintended, unintended consequences on our salmon. I'm not suggesting that our city should stop growing. This is a wonderful place to live and I think everyone should move here. Uh, I'm also not suggesting that we should eliminate artificial light altogether. That would be crazy and we'd have to go to bed at like 4 p.m. in December and nobody wants to do that, so I'm, I'm with you. But a recent study reported that 99% of outdoor light is wasted. So I'm just suggesting that we could use some simple changes and fixes to be smarter and more intentional about the way we use light to help limit the ambient light environment. So some simple solutions include we could shield outdoor lighting uh, to direct light to where we need it so it doesn't just escape into the, into the environment without sort of serving a purpose. We could reduce our light intensity to levels that are actually necessary instead of blasting those bulbs as much as they can go. Uh, this lower picture was taken from a study done in Tucson where they reduced the light intensity of their street lamps from 90% to 30% to see how that changed um, accessibility in the, in the city. We could also put lights on dimmer switches, timers, or motion sensors so that they can be, when we need them, we can use them, but then when we don't, they can turn off. And we can avoid blue hues to light and stick with warmer colors because those warmer colors attenuate much quicker in the water, affecting the fish, the fish much less. So thinking about the way we use light will help us rebalance the scales between predator and prey in Lake Washington to give the salmon more of a chance for survival. These changes can come with other positives like increasing our ability to see the stars, reducing energy usage, and promoting good sleeping habits. 
by reducing artificial light, we can decrease predation pressure on salmon, we can work to revive the sockeye fishery and potentially and create potentially another positive Lake Washington story of recovery to tell. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank my committee members, those folks that spend all night with me out on the lake, and my funding sources. Thanks so much. Okay, so we're going to have a quick change of set so that we can do the Q&A. So if you want to take a couple minutes and relax and think about all of the wonderful questions you want to ask our speakers, um, we will rearrange the stage in just a couple minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you for your patience. I would like to invite anybody who has a question up to our side microphone to ask it. I know that's intimidating, um, but I promise you're not captured by the camera angle. It's just the three of us. Um, the camera's in the back. So uh, feel free to come up and ask any questions you might have for our lovely speakers, um, and please don't be shy. to get so many worm questions. <laughs> yeah, this is about the worms. Cool. <laughs> so what other purpose do the worms, I guess, serve? And what kind of worms are they? Yeah. Um, so I'll answer your second question first. They are nematodes. Um, so they're very tiny, soil-dwelling um, worms. And actually, they became a model organism in like 1969 or something, I think 1970, because someone got them out of a compost bin. <laughs> um, and actually I heard a talk from someone who said that tardigrades or water bears almost became like the it um, model organism, but worms have fewer neurons, so that's why they got chosen. Uh, <laughs> and what do you, like by other purpose, I'm going to assume you mean like what other kinds of things can we study in them? Yeah. So for example, like we can give them diseases. So someone in my lab is studying Parkinson's with like a Parkinson's disease model. I know other labs at uh, I think the VA who study Alzheimer's by expressing those kind of junk proteins in worms. Um, we've also learned a lot about developmental biology, so you know how you go from an embryo to a multi-celled organism. Um, and in fact, someone at the Fred Hutch, where I work, uh, is discovered what we call the PAR proteins or partition proteins, which are really important for making sure the embryo um, is has correct polarity, which just means like the head's going to become the head and the tail's going to become the tail. Um, so we've discovered quite a few things with worms. And one of the powerful things is because they're so small, we can do what are called high throughput studies. So you can like study a whole bunch of drugs and see you know, what they do to certain diseases um, or study a whole bunch of mutations and see what effects they have on certain processes. So I hope that answered your question. I know more people have questions. I know that because I see some familiar faces, at least, who always have questions. So um, this doesn't have exactly pertain to light, but are you aware of any other factors that are being studied that would limit or, I guess, increase the morbidity of sockeye juveniles? There are tons of studies going on to um, address the survivorship of sockeye, especially in Lake Washington. Um, there, well, there are a lot of studies trying to figure out where in the sockeye um, smolt migration, for instance, so after they survive Lake Washington, where the predators um, tend to sort of bottleneck to then gobble them up on their way to the Ballard Locks. So there's some movement studies done for that. And my talk mostly addressed the cutthroat trout, the native predator, but there's lots of studies looking at, 
you know, non-native predators, especially in the um, the really shallow portions of Lake Washington, they could also be having a huge effect. Uh, there's also been like a recent invasion of shad in Lake Washington, and we're uncertain about how that could be affecting sockeye right now. Shad sometimes can um, compete for the same food source as sockeye, so that could be affecting their ability to grow quickly. So there's, unfortunately, it's a hard knock life for salmon right now. There's just a lot that could be affecting them. Um, but what makes Lake Washington so cool is that we know so much about this population and we know about the lake and its trajectory over time. So instead of just going to a lake and trying to figure out everything all at once, we have some of the answers along the way so we can pinpoint um, at least some things that we can change right now. Tessa, what do sockeye salmon eat? When they're juveniles, they eat like zooplankton, those little oh. Daphnia water fleas. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So they don't eat worms, okay? No worms. <laughs> <laughs> but not soil though. <laughs> I'll start with a worm question. Uh, 302 neurons in the brain, and you kept referring to when we look at the neuron. Are you able to go in and get the same neuron in each brain? Is this you're looking at number 206? Or? Yeah, actually, that's precisely it. So worms have what we call a, a fully mapped connectome. They also have a fully mapped fate lineage, which sort of helps with that connectome, So, or fate map. We know, so someone did the job you know, in the 70s and 80s of looking at um, each embryonic cell and what it divides to become. So we know exactly how the neurons are born, like what cells they come from. Um, and similarly, someone looked at every neuron and the other neurons that it talks to. Um, so the neuron that I study, its name is AFD. Um, it's in the same position in every animal. Um, so yeah, we are looking at essentially the exact same neuron between animals. Mm -hmm. Is that 302 neurons in the brain or in the entire worm? Oh, so I should say worms, yes, the whole worm. Worms don't have a brain the way we do. They have what's called a nerve ring, which is just a collection of neurons in the middle of their, or their head region um, that they send all of their projections off of, the, you know, out of that region. So it's the whole, whole animal that the 302 refers to. Uh, I was wondering, like, how does one uh, find out all the impacts of, like, re making a change? For, I, I mean, I think that reducing uh, wasted light and increasing the efficiency of light usage will have positive benefits, but how, how does one, like, study the impact of it uh, on, let's say, all organisms in the uh, water or... So <clears throat> studying the impacts of light is really hard for a lot of different reasons. Number one, it's really hard to measure light at low light levels that exist from artificial light. You know, they're bright compared to the natural night sky, but they're pretty dark compared to just our normal light sensors. Like if you went out and got a commercial lux meter that lighting engineers use, it would read zero if it was out on Lake Washington. But you know with your own eyes that it's really bright. So number one, you sort of have to sort of skirt around that issue. Um, we do that using a log sensor, so it can measure really, really small levels of light, but only in this narrow spectra of blue light. So what we've measured in, on the, the map that I showed that's um, of just a narrow spectra and a relative light level throughout the lake. So we can tell what's brighter and darker. And we um, are moving forward to buying better equipment to then tell us the different levels of all of the different colors of light. So the first part is just quantifying the light around you. Our project is helped by the fact that there were laboratory studies where we could watch fish interact with a variety of different lights to kind of understand what they do out in the wild. Um, obviously, we can't ask a cutthroat trout like what kind of light it enjoys, so we just have to look at its behavior in those measurements, and then we can use that to understand what we're sort of not seeing out there. Uh, my question. 
question mo was more around like I understand that reducing the uh, wasted light will have positive impact oh, yeah. on sockeye, but how do we measure the impact that it could have on, on other species? Oh, on other species of fish or just other species of other things? Yeah. Yeah. Um, All of that. Yeah. Well, the the field of artificial light is kind of in its infancy right now. So that's a really great question because a lot of people are struggling with exactly how to do that. Up until now, most of the studies that have been published are, this is what happens when the lights are on and this is what happens when the lights are off. They don't measure, this is what's happening when the ambient light environment that all of these animals are used to changes or gets reduced. So I guess I don't have a good answer for you there, but I think people would look at behavioral changes and activity levels during the nighttime. If you reduce the light and you're seeing um, moths or other animals that are typically active during the day and not at night, if you're not seeing them as much, that would be an indication that reducing the light level is helping their behavior. This is also a light question. I'm, I'm mentally going over to Bellevue and I'm grabbing the big switch and going <coughs> and turning off downtown. Uh, it feels like very little of that light would actually be reaching the water. I'm thinking it would just be, you know, the lights at the end of the dock and the street light along Lake Washington Boulevard and stuff. How, how much of the, you, you've got water level shots of downtown Seattle and stuff. How much of that light actually is reaching the water and penetrating in? Yeah, so um, it took me being on the lake for a lot of nights to, to kind of understand what light was making it brighter. Um, this is just from an observational standpoint, but the lights of Bellevue, for instance, with all those skyscrapers that are so tall, those lights can carry almost all the way across the lake, definitely to Mercer Island. And the lights, when we launch our boat at Magnuson Park, the lights from Kirkland can carry all the way across the water. It's kind of a disadvantage of having our, our area be so hilly. We've got so, many, so much topography for the lights to then travel further distances. Um, one interesting thing that I've noticed from being out there is that the darkest places are areas that have a bunch of foliage and trees. So areas right off Magnuson Park are really dark, Seward Park, a lot of areas of Mercer Island. Um, those are the darkest areas that I've seen in the lake. I would have expected really bright lights um, closer to where I would imagine you know, Seattle to be, but to be honest, it's, it's covered back behind a, a large hill. So those, those lights don't affect it very much. Now, when you look at from Magnuson Park, sorry, get mm -hmm. the microphone up. When you, when you go to Magnuson Park and look out at Kirkland, mm -hmm. sort of if you're seeing Kirkland and seeing the reflections off the water, isn't that light that's coming to you and not penetrating down to? There's a I portion mean, of it. Down. Yeah, there, there's, por there's a portion of it that does penetrate as well. Okay. And so our next steps are looking at light levels beneath the surface as well. Right now we're using surface light and then we're applying an extinction coefficient to determine the light level at depth, okay. which is just pure physics, but we're hoping to actually gather in situ light levels using an extremely fancy light sensor that we will hopefully purchase very soon um, to determine exactly what the fish are experiencing and what light levels. So I'll be able to answer your question hopefully soon. Okay, thank you. Hey Tessa, how much does the weather affect the light levels on the lake in terms of like cloudiness, rain, like those types of conditions? So clouds, the thing that I'm learning now is that there is not just like one type of cloud. There's a bunch of different types of clouds and some darken the sky and some make the sky a lot brighter. Um, your typical sort of like high wispy cloud kind of magnifies light. It feels like it allows light to travel from where it actually is across the lake. So it seems like there's lights directly above you. Um, then there's also those darker stormy clouds that make it seem really dark out on Lake Washington, especially when it's a new moon. So sometimes they help and sometimes they hurt. <laughs> do you guys control for that in your studies of the, the light? I know you do, but yeah. I, I want to hear the answer. <laughs> when, when we are mapping for artificial light, we do. We can only go out in cloudless, moonless skies so we can start sampling two hours after sunset 
and the moon has to already be down or it has to be a new moon. And so I'm pretty much just looking at the weather all the time and going out when we get those very clear skies. So when I mapped the Sammamish River, it was the middle of January. And when we got out of our kayaks, they were just covered in ice. So you just, you go out when the clouds allow it. Yeah, I asked that because I wanted everybody to appreciate how like limited the studies were. Like, I think it's pretty incredible that you guys have to battle all of these other um, competing situations of weather and time of day and all of that. It is hard when people ask me to do things and I have to tell them, sorry, it's a new moon. I can't. <laughs> They're like, is she in a cult? Like, <laughs> what's happening with the new moon? All right. Does anybody else in the audience have questions? I think we have time for one, one or two more, if anybody does. Hey. Um, okay. This is, a, this is a fish question. Um, so you talked at the end about balancing like the cutthroat trout versus the salmon. How do we figure out what the right balance is between those two? So I would say the closer we can get back to the natural state, the better. Um, in the lighting world, <clears throat> especially the reduction of artificial light at night world, they say you should start with darkness and then you should add the light that you need on top of that. So one of the things that we're doing with that mapping is trying to figure out what's the predation risk right now? What's that like? So that we can start to identify areas to then reduce light to try to just bring it a little bit further back. And then because we know due to hatchery inputs um, how many sockeye are being released in the lake, we can start to kind of do the math to see how many we're saving with those mitigation efforts. I have, a, I have a warm question too. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, how do you look at worms in 3D with your like, because you had your, your video where you oh, see all the little like. Yeah, um, so we look at worms and the preparation is called in vivo. <laughs> so yeah, I take a bunch of worms and I put them on a slide and I knock them out with what's known as sodium azide. It's just a chemical that like, uh, What's that word? Uh, yes, I anesthetize them, yeah. <laughs> um, and then I put a cover slip on top of them, and then I take them to our microscope, and I take a picture of them. Um, and they're see-through, so I can just take a picture of the neurons. The way I made that image is I put them on a fancy microscope called an iSIM, which is like a super resolution microscopy one, and it can just do high resolution imaging. Uh, that was not a high resolution image, but then you just do like a 3D projection. So like you put it in a computer and the computer says like, like I take, oh, sorry, I should probably explain this. I take what's called a Z stack. So you're gonna learn something about confocal microscopy today. So basically it takes, um, it slices your sample into like very thin planes and you can set how big those planes are and it shines light at each of those. And then at the end, you get a stack. You can compress the stack to get an image. And I compressed it in a way to get a 3D image. Um, yes. Cool. <laughs> Thanks. OK. Any last questions? I'll get I have one a question. question. OK. Oh, thanks. So. You've I just love made, microphones. <laughs> you've just made this excellent discovery mm -hmm. with TAT5. Uh-huh. What, what's kind of like the next steps? Beyond this, I know the next steps of your research, but mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. where's the connection from TAT5 to now we're like curing crazy diseases? Okay, that's a great question. Um, so I do basic biology research. That means it's not really um, human applicable until many steps down the line. But I think the next step would be someone who studies this process in mammals, so like uses mouse models, which there's tons of labs that study this process, um, looking at the human or mammalian um, version of this protein. Um, and we know what that is. And it'd be pretty easy <laughs> for someone to look at mutants for that and see if it has an effect. Um, and then I think like the biologists who study this process in mammals would be a little more convinced that it's an important thing. Um, I am convinced it's important, but obviously it depends on the powers that be. So, <laughs> um, yeah, but that would be the next step, is like having someone in another lab look at this protein and see if it has an effect. 
Awesome. Okay, I'm going to end us there because I feel like we got lots of good questions. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, we hope we were able to answer your questions, but if you have a secret question that you didn't want to ask in front of everybody, maybe you can catch our speakers after for a couple minutes. Um, thank you to everybody who came to more than one of these talks. Um, we had a series of, of five nights um, and uh, 15, 14 or 15 amazing speakers. 14, I can count. Um, if you want to learn more about the Engage program at the University of Washington, you're welcome to come and chat with me after, or you can visit our website, which is engage-science.space, or if you are more social media inclined, you can follow us at Engage Science on Instagram and Twitter. Um, if you're a graduate student and you happen to be interested in taking a class about science communication, please do consider applying for our course. Um, applications will open in November um, for the 2024 offering in winter. Um, and yeah, that's about it. So thank you so much for coming and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your night.